the old old school unstructured approach was, gee, if we could just get it all in the content management system, we'd solve the problem. And God, hundreds of millions of dollars again. Why? I don't know why these numbers keep being the same, but but people realizing, no, A, I'm struggling to get even a small percentage in there, and B, it isn't actually solving my problem. I'm talking to Dave McComb. He is the president and co-founder of Semantic Arts. So Dave, maybe tell me, it's in, in your books, there's a story about the Victoria Police Department. Maybe you could tell me <laughs> a little bit about that story. Yeah, that's a funny, I, I heard about these guys, these guys, I forgot where I heard about them from, but, but somebody in Australia got wind of the fact that the Victoria Police Department in you know, Victoria province or whatever they call it, um, put out a bid, <clears throat> And the police cars there already had cameras on their dashboards, but they wanted to use that camera to take pictures of the license plates and check a database to see whether it was stolen or expired. And that was it, basically. And the winning uh, bidder bid $86 million. And, uh, you know, I, actually, I, that's a, a good to do. I should, I wonder what the final uh, total came in at, because almost never did these projects hit their budgets, but yeah. let's assume for the moment it did. There's this software developer in Australia who was, after he saw that, was wondering, gee, I wonder how much of this you could have done with open source. And he starts this project, he eventually writes this, this blog, and he says, I finally, I, I got the entire thing down to a hundred lines of code. And here it is, he has it in his blog, and he says, I, ins I installed this code into my camera in my car and I drive around and find stolen cars, you know, a hundred lines of code. And so I'm re reading this thing, just cracking up. So I just mailed him a copy of my book because he didn't, he hadn't heard of me. Okay. And he, he later said in his blog, he says, I got this thing in the mail. It was this manila envelope. And I was a little afraid to open it because I thought it might've been from those systems integrators and it'd be full of anthrax. <laughs> He says, no, I opened it up as this book and I really liked it and all that. But that just gives you an idea of, of how wide the possibility gulf currently is. And it, and it touches on the fact that people want to solve problems with something big. Like yeah. the first one that hits my head is like, okay, um, I do Raspberry Pi projects and Arduino projects and stuff like that. They have a camera and they have little AI libraries mm -hmm. and that I could probably do something like it. I doubt I could do it in a hundred lines of code, but you never know if right. be collaborating right. with that blogger would we do a good job. And is is that just human nature? Is that just business nature that this is an important project? So we need to do something big. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I was on a raft trip a few years ago and on, on the in the Grand Canyon on the last day we're coming out and talking to one of the other guys in one of the other boats. Turns out he's a systems integrator. I didn't know this. And, in, in one of the midsize, I forgot what the name of the company was, one of the midsize system integration companies. And they have been working on this, this project that was going to be an $800 million CRM project, you know, Salesforce, uh, for a utility company in California. And his, his biggest problem was not but why in the hell would a utility company in California need to spend $800 million on a CRM? And by the way, what what exactly are you doing with a software as a service, you know, almost no code environment that is going to cost eight hundred million dollars? No, that wasn't that wasn't what was bothering him. He was worried that they wouldn't get the project because they didn't have any experience running projects that big, and it was probably going to go to a tier one consultant. And you just go, no, God. The question is, utility companies eight hundred million dollars CRM. I don't think so, I, you know, but yeah, look, to your point, people feel like they have a big problem. And maybe if I spend a lot of money on a big problem, you know, and if I don't spend enough money, it might not get solved. And, uh. Yeah, it, it is. It is a strange irony, especially when you think of the bigger companies. Like, I mean, you and I are smart people and we have mid-sized companies and that type of thing. Having more employees who aren't necessarily as intelligent or experienced as the mid-sized company, 
doesn't mean that you're going to do a better job of any project yet that is kind of the bent for a lot of people well we got to go with a bigger company because they have more employees and like i don't know with 800 million i could i could hire an awful lot of people yeah with pretty much the same skill set as that big company but i i get it it's the world we live in but it's not the world we're gonna live in <laughs> and, and i i i agree and i'm very excited about the opportunity to change like it's when it's music to my ears when you talk about the the million different columns uh on our side we we deal with the unstructured data so it's documents right. and uh, i i believe it's the same problem because you mm -hmm. tell a story different than i do therefore your document is going to look different than mine but the 500 discrete data points or pieces of metadata is the same across these things. And now we finally have systems that can do that. I, I, I see a lot of parallels between those. Would you agree that there's a lot of parallels? In yeah, the, absolutely. Right? You know, talking to you earlier, the, you know, the old, old school unstructured approach was, gee, if we could just get it all in the content management system, we'd solve the problem. And God, hundreds of millions of dollars again. Why? I don't know why these numbers keep being the same, but, but people realizing, no, A, I'm struggling to get even a small percentage in there and B, it isn't actually solving my problem. And when you, and when you get a little more clear about your problem, you say, oh, I, want, I just want a slightly smarter indexing. And, and, and nowadays, you know, slightly smarter uh, extraction and topic mapping and a few, few things that would actually be useful, especially if I could connect them with my structured data. I mean, there that's the, the holy grail right now. I, I agree. It is uh, because the trick is, is that all of your information in the aliases of those information and the connections between them are hiding in that structure, structured data. Yeah. Yep. So normalize the structured data. Then you use all of that aliasing that you did across your unstructured data. And now all of a sudden there's no such thing as unstructured data. I right. get that some are kind of storytelling and documenting and some are very discreet and, and normalized. Either way, it's connected and you can find it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And the, 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 the surprising truth is, you know, what I said earlier, even a large complex organization really is running their business with five or 600 con core concepts that are really interconnected. And most of them wouldn't surprise anybody. You know, it's people and organizations and deductions and commitments and contracts and blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah. it's different for industry, but it's not, and then, and once you know those, they do show up in documents and they show up in all these systems. And you just, you have to know to look for them because if you try and normalize 70 million columns or God knows, you know, a hundred million documents, that's too hard. No, nobody can get their head around it to normalize it. But if you, if you look through the other end of the telescope, all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, all I have to do is find where these 500 things are in that system or that document. And what are they attached to? What do I predict they'd be attached to? Or are they attached to something else? Oh, what is that? I'm, I may discover something I didn't know, but God, most of it is is pretty simple. Yeah, that warms my heart when you say that, because it's we share a vision. And uh, unfortunately, people are tangled up in the way they've been doing it for 30 years. Change is perceived as hard. Um, it, do you have, because you're not saying, you know, you've got to put it into my system before you get any value, but because we're not saying the same thing, do customers get that right away? Or is it something you really need to convince them of or show them first before they really understand the value? Yeah. Of you know, for a while we tried to convince people. And in fact, we would, you know, there's these, there's these conferences where you can pay to go talk to CDOs and CIOs and CTOs, and, and you get a half an hour with these very you know, important, scarce people. But you know what we discovered? I, at least I couldn't convince them in a half an hour. Um, what we do instead is, is just sit here and wait because eventually some of these people convince themselves. People just literally wake up and go, you know, this was kind of a crappy way to do this. I'm going to try something else. They search around, they find us, luckily, some of the time. Um, and and, and we go do a project, what that first project does is allow them to convince their peers. Because up to that moment, the idea is bordering on crazy, 
But once people see their own data in a graph connected in a way they've never seen it before, they go, oh, that's what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, that looks better than what we're doing. I like that. And it's, I've often thought that as well. So somebody needs to get their butt kicked trying it, what let's call the traditional way or the other way before they see the light. Otherwise they think yeah. it, that other way is going to work. One of my hobbies, it's not really a hobby, but, um, and I, I don't spend very, like with most hobbies, I don't spend near enough time with it. But we did some projects with the Colorado Child Support Enforcement Agency years ago, but they were, they were just very high level, a semantic model design, we redesigned their architecture. But in, in that process, and they ended up, the, you know, they have these, got talking about having problems. So they were running this whole system on uh, database and, and software written in the natural programming language. I gotta tell you, finding natural programmers these days is harder than finding COBOL programmers. <clears throat> Anyhow, so they were in this, this technological cul-de-sac. Uh, and interestingly, what we discovered when we worked with them, uh, most states are, and, and about, once every couple of years, some state raises their hands and says, oh, we're going to build a new system. And But because they're funded from the federal government, they have to go back to the federal government to get funding. And they have all these ideas about what should be done. And the, the, the big idea and the bad idea is that you should go get what they call a transfer system. Since we already spent several hundred million dollars in New Jersey, you should take that one as the starting point and then add on and add on. The Colorado guys, uh, dodged that bullet. Interestingly, they just did a, a skunk works project and did a direct conversion into Java and, uh, you know, which was pretty good. We didn't help them with that, but it got them out of the immediate danger. But meanwhile, my hobby was kind of watching what was happening with these projects. So state of Texas, you know, $200 million project. Now I think it started less than that. By the time it got to 300 million, they wanted to sue their implementer but they discovered in order to sue them, they're gonna to have to uh, levy another tax on the people of Texas to get enough money to pay the lawyers to sue the integrators. So instead they just asked the federal government, can we have another hundred million dollars to finish this project? State of California went to $1.7 billion. And just let me uh, give you an idea what child support enforcement is all about. There's three, there's just three pieces to it. And I think perhaps because the three pieces are so different that nobody ever puts them all together. But, but one is you have to have essentially a case management system because you know the, typically it's the mother, but occasionally the father it ha, is not getting their child support anymore. So they go to court, get a case, and, and, and you as the child support enforcement people, you know, it's just like case management. You gather enough pieces of data, you're ready to go. Now you, you start collecting money and distributing it. So there's a there's a financial system in the middle. You get checks and, and they either go to the, the parent or maybe they go to the foster home or someplace. It's not that hard really. Yeah. And the third bit is what they call enforcement. And they've that one's a little tricky. There's a whole bunch of rules about what you can do to put the screws on to to, to make a deadbeat dad pay. Turns out one of the most effective ones is is withholding their hunting license. Oh wow. But okay. you have to give 60 days notice and okay. that, you have to go through this little workflow procedure, ruley thing. But they have like 14 or 15 remedies. Um, and that's it, you know. So, how in the world is that hundreds of millions of dollars? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It, it, it like I say, as an entrepreneur, I look at that and you identify where you can find the efficiencies, not where you can exploit the inefficiency. Yeah, in the thing. Right. So, so the solution we've, we've touched on it from a technical point of view, and I don't want to go too deep in technology, but uh, I like talking about craft networks. Like um, mm -hmm. if you look at the, one of the biggest ones in the world runs at Apple and they don't even brag about it, but they do know how, what songs that you like, and they do know what, development that you've done as part of the development program and they know what devices you've purchased and what warranty service you've got it's yep. all connected even though it's across hundreds or thousands of in their case i believe it's mongodb is their no sequel that they look after but that doesn't matter yeah so 
What I find interesting as we talk about when we build our graph, or perhaps as you build your graph, one of the weird kind of questions that we get is, well, are you using a graph database as if there is something that's a graph database? And I look around my house and say, well, I, I agree, this is just drywall. And behind there is some, some wood and there's probably some plywood between the floors. So technically I don't live in a house. I just live in plywood and drywall and <laughs> whatever. So to me, I think a graph network is, it's an emergent thing. It's not a thing that you just buy. Going back almost to our organic conversation about how healthcare can build up these organic networks. Would you agree with that? Or would you say there is something that you could platonically call a graph network that is a particular technology? I would say that there is, um, and I would say there's two main flavors. You know, there is, you can roll your own for sure. And Apple probably has, and, and some, in, in fact, Google's knowledge graph was originally uh, an open source compliant knowledge graph that they acquired, and then they've repurposed it, you know, to their, to their own needs. But, you know, the, the, the fact that used to be when you'd search in Google, it would give you a document. They were looking for keywords and they would give you documents, but now they give you answers. You go, huh, how do they do that? You know, well, they, they, they literally have a knowledge graph and they, you know, that's where the answers lie. But um, to answer your question, it, you're either rolling it yourself. There's, there's a, a bunch of products that are very popular. They're called labeled property graphs and Neo4j is by far the most popular of them, but you know, there's always there's also um, Tiger Graph and Orient DB and several others that are they're quite good products and and uh, especially developers love them because they're fast to get started and have beautiful graphics with them. But there's another species that conform to an open standard, the, the semantic web stack, um, that we generally advocate because we say don't try to to select a winner right now, pick a path where you can, you, you're not going to have vendor lock in. These things are very standards compliant. We've started clients on one vendor's technology and they change their mind in the middle. You just pick it up and move it. It's, this is not like going from Microsoft SQL server to Oracle, which is a huge project. If you've got any size applications built on it. Now these things are so close to the standards. And really all you're moving is the triples and the queries. Um, once you've moved those, you, you move. So it's depending on how much you've built up and a little bit of tuning you have to do, it's not a big deal. So, um, so I would say that, that there are legit, there is an industry even of, of uh, graph databases that are interoperable. So that is one option for people. For, for sure, and thank you, because it's, and, and I agree, and I wasn't in any way trying to diminish the fact that there are vendors doing a good job of this. Um, but I did hear it as well is that it, it doesn't disqualify anything else that is a graph right. network or a graph database yeah. from being a graph database. Right. And, uh, and that's something that I, I find that the in industry consumers are definitely not conversant in that yet. They think, well, well, which graph database did you use for this? And, and right. our response right. is, well, this is we, how we put it together with these different stacks and da, 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 and it resulted in the graph. Because I agree with you, the uh, the metadata, the relationships is, is the most important piece. The triples are the most right. important piece. And if you can record them, then they do become portable between, and it wouldn't even matter really what stack that you put them on. And right. you could actually put them in relational databases if you want yep. to slow everything down and, and, and make it less scalable. So, so how do people find you, Dave? Well, our website is semanticarts.com. That's probably the easiest way to find us. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I would start there. You know, we've got some case studies and sort of we're, as usual, the cobbler's shoes were kind of behind on our, on our web content, but we're working on that now. But it, I think it, it tells the story that, you know, we're here to, to help uh, firms who want to make this migration to, to being data centric. Uh, and that's, you know, we're not a product vendor and that's our, our mission in life. We're just going to, we're going to sort of help. And, and it's kind of an apprenticeship program that, you know, we're going to bring clients, people along with us. Um, it's not our intention to, 
to outsource anything or make people dependent on us. We're trying to teach and move on. That's fantastic. Thanks a lot, Dave. Great. Thanks, Jason.